America, presented by DuPont. The story of Anne Royal. Adapted for radio from material and new biography of Anne Royal, written by Bessie Rowland James. With the beloved and distinguished star of the American theater, Miss Ethel Barrymore. The DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, takes pleasure in presenting Miss Ethel Barrymore as Anne Royal, the little old woman who lived in Andrew Jackson's day and risked everything she had or hoped for to defend the principle of freedom of speech. My name is Anne Royal. Are we going to stand by while money changers fill their pockets out of the national treasury? Are we going to allow people to undermine the very principles of this democracy? I say run them out before it's too late. I despise Kant. I despise these pious meetings held in the name of a cause. Those caterwauling females and dandies who can't see a hand outstretched in need at their door. I say break them up. Keep this splendid country free of hypocrisy and corruption. Anne Royal talked too much. With blazing eyes and lashing tongue, she went up and down the country exposing falsehood, defending the most precious right in America, the right of free speech, the cornerstone of our personal liberty. Anne Royal believed passionately in free speech, so passionately that she rocked a nation to preserve it. A petticoat editor who stopped at nothing and spared no one in her defense of the right to say what she believed. In July 1829, she was known the length and breadth of the United States. Who remembers her now? Surely someone remembers. <laughs> My name is John Coyle. I remember Anne Royal well. In fact, I was the first to realize how much influence her wagging tongue and biting pen had. People were believing her. Now, I live by the principles of brotherly love, you understand. But Anne Royal went too far. She broke into a meeting and accused me in public of treachery. Treachery? Next day, a few of us called on Mrs. Royal. Indeed, an honor, gentlemen, that you come all the way up the hill to my house. Sit down, won't you? Mrs. Royal, we're not here to mince matters. We won't take much of your very valuable time. But there is a certain matter. You made a most serious charge against me in public yesterday. I only speak what I know. Your society meets regularly with the sole purpose of undermining the government. Mrs. Royal, for many years you've been writing and talking what you think up and down this country. That's quite correct. People have listened kindly. Listened kindly? With their mouths gaping to catch your lying gossip. It's the truth. Every word. Lead. You don't use words like that to uh, a lady. Perhaps we had better say Mrs. Royal is too strong in her opinion. Poppycock. People have a right to know about politicians and organizations that corrupt this free and noble air we breathe. Well, that's neither here nor there. Just a moment, Lee. Mrs. Royal, we don't wish to suppress anybody's earnest efforts and sincere convictions. But we must warn you, we will not tolerate any... You will not tolerate. You, with those hypocrites at work undermining this free government. That's enough. It's not enough. Ever since the world began, there have been those who thought they could strangle the truth. But in this country, it's different. Here, a person can speak the truth freely. I always have and I always will. Perhaps we must remind you, uh, there are courts. There isn't a law you can take me into court on. And we'll make it our business to find one. We'll stop you, Mrs. Royal, if we have to comb every bit of common law from here to doomsday to get you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do what you will. I'm not afraid. And I'll talk as long as there is anyone to hear me. I have the most powerful weapons in the world on my side. Truth and the free right to speak it. I remember Anne Royal. My name is Thomas Swan. I was prosecutor at her trial. As bad a time as I ever had in court. The woman was dangerous. 
She said certain people held political jobs too long. With my record of 28 years as district attorney, I was glad to be the prosecutor that morning when Ann Royal's case was called. Sit here, please, Mrs. Royal. The judge will be along presently. Bad as they are, I never thought they'd drag me into court on such a trumped-up charge. It's perfectly legal, Mrs. Royal. You mustn't take it lightly. As your lawyer, it's my duty to warn you. You're here to answer serious charges. I beg you to use caution. Mr. Cox, you've become as adult as the rest. Order in the court. Order in the court. His Honor William Cranch presiding. All this fuss and feathers to make good their threat. The prosecution will open his case. Proceed, Mr. Swan. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, the prisoner at the bar, Anne Royal, is charged with being a common scold. Common scold, an old forgotten lord, dragged into the light. I must warn the defendant that this charge is legal and valid and carries with it the punishment of the ducking stool. Ducking stool? That's for witchcraft. There'll be order in the court. Proceed, Mr. Swan. Defendant Anne Royal is charged by the people of the District of Washington with being a common disturber of the peace, a common brawler, and a common scold. Your Honor, those are lies. The court will be in order. Mr. Cox, as my lawyer, will you permit that pack of lies to go on? Mrs. Royal, we lose everything if you're going to shout out light in court like that. Are you or shall I tell the court myself? Before the examination of witnesses begins... Is the defendant ready to answer the charge as stated? Your Honor, I'm prepared to answer the charges, but I didn't know witnesses would be called today. My lawyer... Your Honor, I protest. The truth of the matter is, there is not one man or woman in all Washington who would bear Mrs. Royal witness. Then I'll call on heaven. <laughs> I'll get witnesses in the court if the court will grant me 24 hours. Your Honor, I object. One moment, Mr. Swan. Mrs. Royal, this is a fair trial. Call your witnesses for 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we shall proceed with the trial. Your Honor, court is adjourned for the day. Remember Anne Royal? I'm Sally Stack, the best friend she had before the trial and until her death. I worked with Anne over her writings. She called me Secretary Sally, and I think I knew her better than anyone else in the world. Her courage, her love of country from her pioneer childhood, her eccentric clothes because she didn't care and had no others. The gods must have chuckled as we reached home that afternoon. Two shabby old women defying the world. Throw open the window, Secretary Sally. We're home, and I want to get the stench of the courtroom from my nostrils. And I want to get the sound of those voices from my ears. The voices we didn't hear struck my ears the loudest. Of a sudden, my old friend, General Van Ness, has developed poor ears and good legs. Twice I spoke when he hurried down. Sally, we live in a mightily shrunken world this evening. Cowards. All of them. A year ago, they stood around like gaping fools to hang on your lightest word. But witnesses, Anne, you must get them. There's just one I want, just one. With him here, I could forget all the others. I. And he would turn in his grave now to see what they're doing to his wife. No, no, he wouldn't. William Royal would hold up his head and fight as he fought the redcoats. And he'd have me do the same against my enemies. But who are my enemies, Sally? Why have they done this to me? Because they're cowards, Anne. And you have no fear. But the ducking school. I'm old. They know. They know I couldn't survive it. So I'll go. Lawyer Cox, no doubt. I right, come up from his papers for air. Is Mrs. Royal at home? She is, sir, but I... Oh, bring him in, Sally. Heavens, we've always received people and always will. Today's no different from any other. I'm glad you feel that way, Mrs. Royal. I'm not sure I agree. Well, William Leeds. And what is it this time? Well, I've come with an offer, Mrs. Royal. So we will bargain this time. Now, you've been trying to get a pension for some time, Mrs. Royal. Rightfully so, for my husband's services in the revolution. Well, if you will cease writing, if you will withdraw your books and hold your tongue, that pension can be arranged. If you think you can silence me... You can live comfortably and quietly the rest of your life. I'm not interested, Mr. Leeds. Well, perhaps we might arrange to dismiss this trial. 
this whole distressing matter will be forgotten. And if I should refuse? The choice is yours, madam. Well, that's clear. We're in the open. And here's my answer. Go home and tell your filthy schemer that Anne Royal will write and talk the truth as long as there is a spark of life in her. Very well, Mrs. Royal, if that's your answer. But I will not be responsible for whatever your enemies do to you. Anne? Anne, what's that noise? You can't fight the whole world, Mrs. Royal. Look out the window. Anne, look out. Some more of the fine work of your friends, Mr. Leeds? Hoodlums that would prey on women. I'll answer them. Anne, don't go to the door. Mrs. Royal, you're in danger. I'm not afraid of this danger. It's in the open. What do you want? forehead's bleeding. Nothing. A piece of glass grazed me. Now you, Mr. Lee, you and your friends have done a fine night's work. Now get out. Get out before two women push you out. Get out. Get out. Anne. Anne, sit down. Shaking like a leaf. I'm all right. Sally, where's my bonnet? Heavens, you're not going out now. With that mob? I'll go the back way. I've just thought of my last witness, and I'm going to get him. Who? Andrew Jackson, President of the United States. My name is George. I belong to General Jackson. I was his manservant. I shall never forget Miss Royal that evening when she come a-marching up the steps between them pillars, a-pounding with all her might on the knocker. General Jackson always did let anybody who wanted to see him come right in. Figured if folks couldn't see the president, there wasn't much use of having one. Ask Miss Royal to come in, George. Tell Cook to set another place for supper. Yes, sir, General Jackson. But uh, if I can say it, sir, if she don't look hungry this time. She look mad. I expect so. Sure in. Uh, come in, please, Mrs. Royal. General Jackson. Well, evening, Miss Royal. Good evening, ma'am. Sit down, won't you? Mighty glad to see you. Thank you. Those are rare words for me to hear these days. So they're after you, huh? You know? Oh, yes. News trickles in here once in a while. Well, I see you have your head bandaged. They stoned my house tonight. Mm, that's bad, man. I can send a guard. No, no. That's not what I want. Mr. President, you've always been a friend of mine. Why not? We're two of a kind, ma'am. Sort of rough. With frontier mud on our shoes that sometimes splashes on the carpets of these nice parlors. I like the way you speak out your mind, like your lungs were full of good, clean Tennessee air. That's kind of you, sir. I'm afraid not many others feel as you do. Not backing down, are you? No. Mr. President, would you go on the witness stand for me? Witness stand? Yes. And tell them what I've said is the truth, that I have a right to say it. What are they trying to do to our country when a man or woman can't speak his mind? Well, I tell you, ma'am, if I was plain Andrew Jackson back in the saddle, I'd say a word for you. But I'm President of the United States now. But, Mr. President, couldn't I subpoena you? <laughs> so, so you're going to subpoena the President, eh? Well, that will make history. Ma'am, I'm blamed if I wouldn't like to see you do it. But if the president could be subpoenaed, he'd be spending all his days in court with a number of folks out after his hide. Everybody hating an old woman who wants the truth to be known. They gave us a constitution. They said a lot about freedom of speech and ideas. We've still got the constitution, ma'am. Maybe folks are beginning to forget what it means. I know, Mr. President. I was a little girl when it was written. Maybe we were all children then. Only now we've grown up and the dream has vanished. And the land is black with evil, Mr. President. And the fawning little men who are betraying the noble heritage of the giants of our American childhood. Washington and Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. Ms. Royal, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have Major Eaton, the Secretary of War, be a witness for you. And I'll tell him to speak a word for your character. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Now, 
we stay and have some supper here? Wish I could, Mr. President, but Sally Stack is alone, waiting. Well, maybe I can send some supper with you. Uh, George. Yes, sir. What? Well, blamed if I don't think you stand behind the curtain and listen. Oh, oh no, sir. You go fetch the plumpest white leghorn chicken you can find in the hen house and bring it in here. With the head? With the head. And hurry, because Royal don't want to wait. <laughs> William Cranch, judge on the bench at the trial of Anne Royal. Remember her? I'll never forget her. It was a troublesome business. She had friends in high places, but she had enemies, too. And already the case had begun to reek in the newspapers. Though most of the editors hated and feared Mrs. Royal, they were turning our witchcraft trial, as they called it, into a Punch and Judy show. And small wonder as the trial went along. I remember that afternoon, Coyle was on the witness stand. As the court knows, I bear only Christian charity in my heart for this misguided woman whose poor talents have been put to so unfortunate a use. Yes, yes, go on, Mr. Coyle. What did Mrs. Royal say when she broke up your meeting? She accused us of treachery. She said we were trying to undermine the government. And accused you of treachery? Well, uh, of course, that, that is a rather strong word. And, of course, untrue. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, we may have uh, talked over the clerical party. Lies, Your Honor. Order, order. order. Proceed with the testimony. You see, the woman is obviously malicious and hysterical. Lies. In the course of her speeches and criticism, what else did Mrs. Royal call you? Only my love of honesty. Answer the question, please. She called me Pumpkin Willie. <laughs> Thomas Timms, uh, that is your name? Yes, sir. What is your occupation? I am porter of the Senate. Mr. Timms, to your knowledge, has the witness ever spoken slanderously? Oh, yes, sir. Indeed? Will you please tell the court when? Mrs. Royal said that Mr. Watterson and I were the handsomest men in Washington. And if that isn't slander on all the other Washington men, I... I protest. Are we to make this court the laughing stock of the country? You did that when you built the ducking stool at the Navy Yard, Mr. Swan. <laughs> I'll clear this courtroom. Will the prosecution go on? That is all, Your Honor. We have too much respect for womanhood to undermine this woman's character further. The witnesses have concluded their testimony that Anne Royal has made a public nuisance of herself as a common scold. The prosecution rests. Will the Honorable John A. Eaton take the stand? Anne, the Secretary of War. Andy Jackson must have sent him. He'll give you a good character. John H. Eaton. And Major Eaton, you are Secretary of War, are you not? Yes, sir. What do you know about Mrs. Royal's character? I know Mrs. Royal to be a courageous and honest woman, and I've never known her willfully to slander any human being. I know her only as a woman whose pen dares to write the truth. There will be order in the court. That will do it. No, it won't, Sally. It's all a horrible farce. Even Eaton's kindness doesn't mean a thing. You'll see. I would like the defendant herself to take the stand. Mrs. Anne Royal. Anne, remember. Be calm. I'll be calm. This way, please, Mrs. Royal. I know my way, thank you. Anne Royal, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in this trial shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. And uh, Mrs. Royal, would you tell the court in your own words why you objected to this Meeting? Yes, I'll tell them. I heard a lot of caterwauling females and a lot of young men talking against this country. I told them they'd better be home practicing Christianity. Then what happened? They threw books at me, so I drove them out. I told them not to come back to the neighborhood until they could behave decently. Mrs. Royal, did you accuse prominent office holders of self-interest? If you mean by that that I think there are too many people in the government who care more for their jobs than their country, yes. 
And if the donkeys in this country can't see... Why do I object? Personal opinions are irrelevant. That's what you're trying me for, isn't it? <laughs> Objection overruled. In this case, the personal opinions of the accused are exceptionally relevant. Mrs. Royal, you run the risk of fine for contempt of court. There isn't enough money in the world, Your Honor, to pay for my contempt of this court. <laughs> now, proceed, Mrs. Royal. Your Honor, I have very little to say. I doubt if you could hear it over the baying of the hounds who have run me up this tree. But if the wish of our good friends to make war, let it be war. Let it even be the ducking stool. I've no ideal but a love of humanity. No politics but the welfare of our country. For this country, I shall fight every evil I find. And wherever the shoe fits, let it be worn. If what I say is not the truth, then there are laws of libel to prosecute me which have not been invoked in this court. You can't do this to me. I'm an American citizen with a right to free speech. Gentlemen of the jury, you have considered the evidence in the case of the People versus Anne Royal. How say you? Is the accused guilty as charged or not guilty? Guilty. My name is Richard Wallach. I remember Anne Royal. Yes, I guess I was one of the few friends Mrs. Royal had that terrible afternoon. I was only 18, but I worshipped Mrs. Royal for her kindness and wit. Gladly, I went with her from the court. Her step was unsteady, but she would not lean on my arm. That a court of justice and a court of the United States could be so used. But Mrs. Royal, the judge waived the ducking for only a $10 fine. And Secretary Eaton himself paid the fine and bond. Aye, a bond to keep the peace like a common vagrant. Major Eaton must be deeply shamed. But don't you see, a few of us believe in the rights you spoke for today. Right? No, they're dead. Dickie, you're going to be a great journalist someday, so learn your lesson. Think and talk their way, or else you too will be a voice crying in the wilderness. Do you believe that? Do you indeed? You're a very wise little boy. Who am I? You're a witch, and my mother says you're going to be ducked in the water until you're dead. Yeah, you're Oh, let's hurry, Mrs. Royal. This is terrible. No. Let's rest here for a moment, Dickie. You asked me a question a moment ago. Yes, but I shouldn't have asked it. How could you have any faith left? No, you were right to ask, and I want to answer. Here, with the sunshine on us and the elm trees whispering above us, and the white buildings of the Capitol gleaming there on the hill. No, Dickie, I'm not a voice in the wilderness. I'm part of this as you are, and those small boys, and the justice and tolerance that'll grow up to find. Then they haven't stopped you, Mrs. Royal? Stop me, let me tell you, Dickie. I have plans for starting a newspaper, a paper to speak the truth and defend the right. That has been my faith, and as I have lived, I will die by it. I believe in this country and its people. I believe in the divine principles of justice and freedom for which these people fought, uh, which will grow up as the nation grows. I believe that no petty evil or temporary wrong can harm the enduring greatness of the American spirit. Freedom of speech, that cherished heritage of Americans, has come down to us because patriots like Anne Royal, that little old woman in her bonnet and shawl, fought in a time of prejudice and malice to keep that ideal alive. And for her struggle to preserve this American tradition of free speech, Anne Royal takes her rightful place in the cavalcade of America. Thank you, Miss Barrymore. We're proud to have you as our guest on the Cavalcade of America. And now, 
Before we present our historian, Dr. Frank Monahan of Yale University, we have a story from the wonder world of chemistry. At a dinner in the city of Washington, two beautiful transparent globes were displayed side by side. One of these spheres was crystal, pure, flawless, a rare art object worth at least $50,000. Guards stood by to see that it did not fall and break. The other sphere looked so much like the $50,000 one, even experts could not tell the difference. But it was made of DuPont's lucite plastic at a cost of less than $150. This crystal clearness of lucite is one of its fascinating qualities. It has a strange ability to carry light around corners. That is why it's being used for surgical instruments, to bring cool light to the exact spot where it's needed. It also has an incredible power of reflection. That's why highway markers are being made from it, reflectors that outline the road a full mile in front of your headlights. And lucite is only one of the new developments in this field. Truly, this is an age of plastics. One of the most recent developments is DuPont's butacite plastic. When stretched, butacite eases back slowly to its original shape. Placed between two layers of glass, it makes the clearest and strongest safety glass yet produced. And it gives when something hits it, thus taking up part of the shock. Butacite holds the glass so tightly that even though a windshield may be crushed into small bits, the fragments adhere to the plastic binder so well you could roll it up like a rug and take it home with you. There's a real spirit of adventure behind the research on plastics. In 1929, DuPont organized a special plastics research unit composed of chemists with a fresh, original approach to unsolved problems. These men are now looking ahead to big things. But don't think it's easy to create these modern wonders. It may take from five to ten years of continuous research to develop a single plastic. Yet who knows? Perhaps someday we shall all live in plastic houses, drive plastic motor cars, fly in plastic airplanes. Meanwhile, in two DuPont plants, in Lemister, Massachusetts, and Arlington, New Jersey... More than 2,700 workers are busy producing modern plastic products that make good the DuPont pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. And now, Dr. Monahan. Next week, Cavalcade presents one of the most fascinating stories of the entire American Revolution. The story of Enoch Crosby, the spy. He was a daring secret agent who was frequently in danger of death at the hands of both the British and the Americans. His thrilling and poignant story gave James Fenimore Cooper the materials for the first truly American novel. But the real story of Enoch Crosby, as will be portrayed in next week's Cavalcade by the noted American actor Henry Howe, is far more dramatic than Cooper's celebrated novel. On tonight's program, the orchestra and musical effects were under the direction of Don Voorhees. Until next week at the same time, this is Basil Rysdale saying good night and best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.